So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my research program today. Um, just to start, I um, just want to sort of describe the, the biobehavioral approach that we take uh, to the research pro program in, in my lab. So uh, this is sort of a part of the tobacco control arc. Um, and it starts with how people engage with their tobacco products, which is the packaging, the marketing, the advertising, labeling, things like that. That affects how they see themselves as a smoker, their image as a smoker, um, can affect how intensely they smoke. So we measure things like puffing topography, where you can characterize how deeply people puff on their cigarettes, how much they smoke. And that together helps us understand um, exposure. And smoke exposure is not this ubiquitous, you know, you puff more and you just get more. The uh, intensity <coughs> of uh, how you puff, uh, whether you block things, uh, filter vents, the type of product you're smoking, uh, can change what the delivery of the smoke is. So uh, we'll look at things like nicotine and 1-hydroxypyrene and some of the nitrosamine specific um, uh, compounds. Uh, we'll look at things like tar and salanosol to get a better understanding of how much nicotine is being delivered. Uh, and then things like small particulate matter like XL breath condensate and carbon monoxide. So it's not just this ubiquitous, you get more. There's different sort of ratios of what you, what you get. Um, there's clearly other parts on this uh, side of the arc, so social influence and social media and all of these things that could uh, lead a person to smoke. And you know, my lab doesn't look at, at people with disease conditions, so we're not looking at once you develop the disease, we're just looking at biomarkers and exposure as a result of uh, using different products. So there's a, a, sort of a complicated uh, story between uh, communication, marketing, advertising, uh, use of product. And so I want to show you this slide. The dark black line represents the uh, per capita cigarette consumption in the United States through uh, the 1900s through uh, the early 2000s. Uh, a couple things I want to point out. So things that you probably know about, like the first Surgeon General's report, broadcast ad ban, where public health realized that it was important to regulate the amount of exposure you're getting from tobacco ads. So when you're growing up, the outfield wall of the baseball stadium, there are these big Winston uh, you know, posters on the back. Those things like that have been banned. Um, <clears throat> this is a really interesting period of time to, to talk about communication and, and cigarette smoking. So in 1950, Dolan Hill published um, Smoking and Carcinoma of the Lung. This was the first paper to suggest that there's this association between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. Um, so it was in BMJ, 1950, uh, and you can see after that it had no impact on smoking rates. Um, great, great paper, well done. It wasn't reaching, so it was good, good information, but not reaching the people that really needed it. It wasn't until two years later, Reader's Digest took up the story, so it was cancer by the carton. Um, for the uh, younger scientists in the room, Reader's Digest was this sort of <laughs> weekly um, uh, publication that came out that was it basically was in every house in the, in the country at, at the time. And so it presented the information in a way that the average person, including the many that smoked, were able to get the information and understand the information. And shortly after that, we see this decrease in the cigar consumption. Enough so that tobacco companies' stocks dropped. Um, they, they, they realized this was an important turning point in cigarette smoking in, in the United States. And so in January of 1954, they released a frank statement. The frank statement was the first social engineering experiment conducted in the United States. So um, six of the leading tobacco companies got together with um, Hill and Knowlton, which was a large PR firm in Manhattan, and they wanted to find ways to discredit the science that was coming out in this period. So um, the uh, things that, that carry through uh, e even till uh, today, both in tobacco uh, research and, and other topics. Um, and so their goal was to uh, take out um, 400 ads across the United States on a Sunday morning to reach 43 million uh, citizens to discredit the science that was being conveyed in the Dolan Hill paper, Reader's Digest, to try to create uh, confusion, um, to discredit the scientists, to discredit the science. What's that? Well, so 
So I think it's an interesting and timely topic. So um, I'll, I'll stop there, but, but this idea that, that the communication, that the first engagement with a tobacco product is not when you put the thing to your lips. You've already created some expectations about the risk profile, what you're going to get out of it, how harmful it is, things like that. Um, and so uh, the last point to make on this slide is even through the 2000s, with all of these restrictions in place, uh, and this is adjusted for yearly inflation, um, the best estimate I have is from uh, 2016, tobacco industry is spending $8.9 billion domestically to market their product. Right? They're not doing that because they have $8.9 billion laying around. It's that they know it helps drive the market in terms of who's buying what product, what's the risk perception of the product, uh, how they're going to use the product. So this piece between communication and product and exposure is really important. Fast forward to slightly after 2009. Uh, so the Obama administration passes the Tobacco Control Act, which gives the FDA and the U.S. Food and Drug Administration the ability to regulate tobacco products in a series of ways. One of the first things they did was to ban descriptors. So we used to have Marlboro Lights, Camel Lights. That uh, implied that somehow that cigarette was less harmful than other things on the market. So that a Marlboro Light wasn't quite as bad as a Marlboro Red. Factually untrue. But the industry was using these descriptors for a long period of time to help offset some of these worries that the US population was getting about the harms of cigarette smoking. And so when the descriptor ban, prior to the descriptor ban being enacted, so Altria is the parent company of Philip Morris, um, they came out with uh, inserts, onserts, things that they shared with the retailers, so like with the local Wawa 7-Eleven. So, that the packaging is changing, but the product stays the same. If the old pack was a Marlboro Light, you should now be asking for a Marlboro Gold. So they realized that they had to educate both the retailer and the consumer. If they're coming in asking for a Marlboro Light, you hand them a Marlboro Gold. So they changed the thing, they dropped the light descriptor, but they used this color coding uh, to, to continue to describe cigarette packs. These, these are concerts that were on the packs of cigarettes, so in the future, ask for a Marlboro, it's in the gold pack. So they wanted to educate because they were concerned about this descriptor ban. We published a paper uh, on this. So in the 12 months after the descriptor ban, um, about 80% of brand loyal smokers had no idea that that had even taken place. They sort of like translated in their head that you need to go to the store, ask for a pack of lights, they were handed a pack of golds, their life didn't change. So they were not aware. So the FDA thought this was going to be a huge communication uh, victory and in fact people are sort of doing the same as they've done before. So again, the industry is very aware that they need to get out in front of this uh, in, around the communication of tobacco products. So um, one of the other uh, areas that the Tobacco Control Act allowed uh, was to regulate the amount of nicotine in a cigarette. And so the FDA has released an advance notice of proposed rulemaking, which is sort of a a pre-announcement, this is from uh, mid-2018, uh, that they're heavily considering this. Um, these things often, often end up in the courts, which is uh, some of the reason that we, we do the work that, that we do. Um, and, uh, but, but they have this intention to move forward. And so uh, this would be to regulate the content. This is not the yield. And I just want to make a quick distinction in that the Marlboro lights that used to exist that had a low yield on a very bad testing regimen that has now been thrown away. It was the Federal Trade Commission tested cigarettes uh, by taking a 35 milliliter puff in a two second duration. They trapped all of the smoke extract on a pad that measured the tar nicotine and carbon monoxide that was in the cigarette. Those were the numbers that used to be on the side of a pack of cigarettes. And if you're at a certain level, you uh, achieve light designation, if you're at a very low level, you achieve ultralight designation. That was the yield on a very flawed test. People don't take 35 milliliter puffs, they don't take them in a two second duration, and they take them more frequently than once per second. All right? So, so the end, what the industry was trying to do is find a way to make the cigarette test low, even though the content of the cigarette had much more nicotine and tar than what was on the side of the pack. So one of the primary things that they did, and I had a color, this is the filter cut open, uh, about 11 to 15 millimeters from the proximal end, from the mouth end, they would place a series of holes in the filters so that when it was being tested, 
air, ambient air would be pulled in through the filters, dilute what goes into that syringe, and then cause the levels to be low. So a light cigarette had about 25% ventilation, meaning 25% of that 35 milliliter puff was just air, so test low. An ultralight would have about 80% ventilation. So 24 milliliters out of that 35 was air, so an ultralight would test low because we're basically sampling air. And that, and that was the sort of the, the main thing. And so what happened was, if you looked at different types of biomarkers of exposure between lights and regulars and ultralights, they're about the same in smokers. So there's a difference between yield and content. What the FDA is considering now is to regulate content, nicotine content. So this is a different type of cigarette than the Marlboro Golds that are on the market. And so we were one of 10 sites um, around the country that were part of the scenic trials where we used tobacco that was genetically modified tobacco so that it was a lower nicotine content. Right? So we're talking about actual low nicotine level cigarettes. And this is what FDA is considering doing. And so one question is, is there a dose of low nicotine that, that decreases the, the amount of smoking, that suppresses the amount of smoking? So the first question is, what's the dose? So we ran a study uh, with our colleagues around the country of 839 smokers. And what we see is that there's about a five cigarette per day difference after six weeks between the lower doses of nicotine content and the medium to moderate doses of nicotine content. And the division line's right around 2.4 milligrams I'm pointing out these two doses here uh, for a study that I'm going to tell you about in, a, in, in just a moment. Um, but um, you know, encouraging that there is this dose that starts to separate how much someone smokes um, when provided these cigarettes. The second question was, uh, do you do this gradually or immediately? So do you rip the Band-Aid off or do you pull it off slowly? Right? And there's sort of competing uh, reasons to, to consider each. And so uh, the second part of the scenic trial uh, that we published in, in 2018 looked at, uh, compared to a control group, do you do this immediately or gradually? And, and the immediate reduction has a greater decrease in cigarettes per day, so this was the main paper out of this study, but over a series of biomarkers, inflammation markers, uh, psychological measures, uh, subjective responses, urges to relapse or to, to, switch, to, to switch to the other products, all of these things suggest an immediate reduction as an advantage. So we now know the dose and we know the um, how quickly to do it. Similar work in our lab, so these are all multi-site nationwide studies. Um, similar uh, uh, work in our lab um, looked at the same cigarettes with the low nicotine uh, at two different levels, so that's 5.2 and 1.3 dose, and we uh, were curious about uh, are there subgroups at risk? So one concern from a public health perspective is if overall there's this decrease, but there's a subgroup that might be at greater risk, um, that would be important to know. And so we wanted to look at nicotine metabolism rate with the idea that if you were providing someone with a low nicotine content cigarette and they were a fast metabolizer of nicotine, one might hypothesize that they're gonna puff more intensely or use more cigarettes in order to maintain their amount of nicotine because they're getting this low nicotine uh, content cigarette. That wasn't the case. And so we see a, a pattern of cigarettes per day um, the total puff volume, so how much they're, they're puffing out of each cigarette, decreases when they use these lower nicotine cigarettes. And as a result, we see lower nicotine uh, biomarkers as well as NNAL, which is one of the, the nitrosamine carcinogens found in cigarette smoke. So overall, there's not a subgroup at risk from a genetic profile, and we see patterns similar to the national trial that we did. Now, these are important studies, but there's a limitation. Um, the government issued research cigarettes are not backed by almost $9 billion in marketing. And I think in the first few slides, I made a compelling case that that might be important. Um, so uh, this is what research subjects get, and, and certainly not an appealing looking uh, cigarette pack. So we wanted to try to explore some of uh, how those issues might work. There was one example of a commercially available nic low nicotine content cigarette that came onto the market. And in the interest of time, I'll only say that, so this was a, a project that um, we, we did just in our lab as a single site, and compared to uh, getting their own brand, we have to see a very similar pattern, although it's between uh, group, uh, a similar pattern of results in terms of uh, maybe a little bit more use at the moderate levels because they can work harder to get some out of the, the low nicotine, but when they get to the very low nicotine content of cigarettes, they smoke less intensely. The point that I want to make that was different about this line of work than the prior work is that we could try to examine the marketing of it. 
And so at the baseline period, we exposed the participants to the marketing of this, this product. So you're on the market as Quest, there are three different levels. Um, and we tried to assess prior to them smoking the product what they thought about the risk profile. And we did that a few days in advance. We were trying to mimic what might happen in a real world scenario where um, you don't just immediately see the ad and then start smoking the cigarette. You may see it in a magazine or online a few days later you're at a store, you purchase the product. And what we found was that there's this interesting interaction so that the people who had above average false beliefs, so they thought that the product was somehow less harmful than their own cigarettes. And when they tried them, they weren't terrible. Those were the ones that were more likely to use more. And so this interaction between um, if you thought it was less harmful and when you tried them, they weren't terrible, you were more likely to use them. So this was one of the first uh, studies to show the sort of interaction of what predicts the amount of use on a, on a novel cigarette like this. So the next step was now that we know that there's false beliefs, we wanted to try to better understand can we correct them. And so we took the ad and photoshopped it to give different types of treatment where we corrected both the explicit and implicit uh, sort of components of the ad. So this is what the industry was using. And so they were blue packs, get on the road to nicotine free, you're on the, you know, moving toward the sun and the clouds and all of that kind of cool stuff. Um, we tried to make it darker. We embedded correctives. And so I'm gonna below these two, the, the, the top left and bottom right, just to be a little bit bigger. Um, and so we did two things. We added some information about the tar level of these cigarettes um, that's not in here. So we wanted to see if embedded corrective information in the body mattered. And part of that was because the text warning that was on the bottom across a series of three studies between 25 and 35% of our participants said this was a product that was going to help me quit smoking, despite the fact that the warning read that this is not intended for you to quit smoking. And so we wanted to kind of know why are they being misled like that. Um, and so uh, we, we ran participants through the four conditions and we did eye tracking on them. And so what I've done here is sort of model the, the higher the peaks represents the greater the viewing attention time to this. And so in a text only world, people don't read the graph, the, uh, the, the warning areas. Um, and so that makes sense. Uh, but we, now we have uh, empirical objective data to, to show that people don't read the warnings. However, they're reading these areas, and so when we embedded the correctives in the body of the ads, they were actually getting that information correct. So an important change. Um, the next step in this was to uh, examine what would happen if we used a graphic warning instead of just a text only. And so we took sort of the iconic Marlboro ad um, and embedded a warning label from Health Canada because at that point warning labels weren't proposed in the US and did another study where we, we wanted to see does the recall differ and we're able to show that uh, a significantly greater proportion of the participants seeing the graphic condition were able to recall the information compared to the text so the graphic mattered in terms of getting the information. Um, they viewed the in information differently. So you can see visually here that they engaged with that graphic uh, area much more than they did in the text. And most importantly, there was an association between how you viewed and the recall. So the quicker you put your eyes on the image and the longer your eyes stayed on the image, the better you were at recalling. So it really helps to demonstrate how the warning label uh, works for effectiveness. Um, so as that was uh, happening, the FDA proposed graphic warning labels, which was one of the other areas that they uh, had considered doing through the Tobacco Control Act. And so they proposed an initial set of nine warning labels. Um, and we've done a series of studies on this that have been led by postdocs. So uh, Kirsten Lockfuehler was uh, in our lab for two years, Melissa Merchinkiewicz, who's now part of the faculty. Um, we did a series of studies where we've looked at the format. So it's not just that it's a graphic warning, but um, how people engage with different types of of warnings and so not surprisingly a hole in the throat with smoke coming out of it gets a lot of attention and so if you pair that with the text or it's a congruent message people are better at understanding it than if you have two different types of messages between the text and the image um, and so we're taking that a step further to look at um, sort of more complex things downstream and so we've developed some models where uh, so this is sort of things we're working on now where the viewing patterns actually associate with their intentions to quit 
but also uh, behaviorally how they smoke their cigarettes and how many they smoke per day. So sort of more objective measures than just them stating some intention to try to quit in the near future. They're actually smoking differently. And so the last point that I want to make is we sort of smashed all of this together and uh, put it into a center grant submission. Uh, and we were awarded at the end of uh, in September of 2018, we're one of nine sites to get a, a Tobacco Center of Regulatory Science where we're conducting a series of studies. Um, and so we have a low nicotine cigarette packaging study that um, I lead and Melissa's a part of. Uh, project two is between us and the Annenberg School looking at advertising and correctives and some of the stuff that we presented. And then we have sort of parallel studies that around cigarillos and little cigars, which are also combustible. Uh, tobacco product that's harmful. Um, and so these are going on, but uh, we have a career enhancement core that uh, funds pilot studies that is not just a training core for pre and postdocs, but uh, also mid-level people who want to get involved with tobacco control issues. And so um, we have opportunities to sort of encourage engagement. Um, each of the asterisk uh, individuals are junior people, either postdoc or junior faculty level that we intentionally design the study to kind of get them in the trenches. And so we are really committed to trying to train uh, junior people by having them integrate it with the, uh, the study, uh, the studies that are going on. Um, and we have a tobacco industry marketing core and a biosample analytic core that can help support projects as well. And so if you're doing anything in this domain um, between the, the, the three cores, uh, we'd be happy to try to collaborate and, uh, and work with you. So uh, I'll end there. Thank you.